Uh, well, I am the son of uh, entrepreneurs. So uh, funny that you say you're from Jamaica. My mother is actually uh, Jamaican. Uh, my father is uh, Bermudian. And uh, yes, she's from Clarkstown, Trelawney. You know, the parish where all the fastest people in the world come from. Listen, so hold on, hold on. My viewer, I am from Trelawney. Oh, you are? Okay. Yes, so I know Clarkstown very well. The premier of Bermuda, the Honorable David Birch the youngest person to serve as the leader of that nation on the Trailblazers. Hey, I'm Tamara McHale, host of the Trailblazers series. Remember to hit that notification bell right below and subscribe. I took a 75 beautiful black X5 to drive in at Tita, a second time. And Oprah grabbed my hand. She was like, all right, you know, Show One me. thing that I learned from Steve Harvey's office if I remember he had gotten fired from that particular radio station. If you don't get single-minded and push certain things, they never get accomplished. Yes, you have to be resolute in your purpose. That is That's right. And you have to put a timeline on it. That must be done by. It will shortly be my privilege in accordance with section 58 of the Constitution, to appoint Edward David Gerald Burt II as the Member of the House of Assembly best able to command the confidence of a majority of members of that House as Premier of Bermuda. It is without question an awesome responsibility, one which we will not take lightly. Today, I take the oath of office of Premier of Bermuda. Premier the Honorable E. David Burt is Bermuda's youngest Premier, having taken office at the age of 38 years old in 2017. He is also the leader of the Progressive Labour Party, PLP. Mr. Burt is a graduate of the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., where he graduated cum laude with a Bachelor of Business Administration with a double major in Finance and Information Systems. He was awarded the George Washington University Presidential Administrative Fellowship and received his Master's of Science degree in Information Systems Development in 2003. Mr. Burt attained a Project Management Professional Certification in 2009. He is also a licensed private pilot. An entrepreneur, Premier Burt started GMD Consulting Limited, an IT consulting company focusing on project management. Premier Burt also co-founded Hitch Limited and was the lead developer for the award-winning Hitch mobile app, enabling Bermuda residents to hail taxes. In the past, Premier Burt has served on the Tourism Board, National Training Board as a director of the Bermuda Chamber of Commerce and has been a director of the Bermuda Economic Development Corporation. Mr. Burt is also active in local and international public service and community organizations. He is married to wife Kristin and together they have two children, Nia and Edward. Hi Premier Bert, a pleasure to have you joining us on the Trailblazers. And of course, especially being in Bermuda, we're in, I'm in Jamaica, but the power of technology, we can connect. Absolutely, it's a pleasure to join you. Thank you so much. So we are jumping right into your story because we view you as a trailblazer being the youngest serving leader of your nation. And we're, we're, you know, we're curious to find out your upbringing and how you got started. Tell us about that. Uh, well, I am the son of uh, entrepreneurs. So uh, funny that you say you're from Jamaica. My mother is actually uh, Jamaican. Uh, my father is uh, Bermudian. And uh, yeah, she's from Clarkstown, Trelawney, you know, the parish where all the fastest people in the world come from. Listen, so hold on, hold on. My viewer, I am from Trelawney. Oh, you are? Okay. Yes, so I know Clarkstown very well. <laughs> so that is, so that is uh, my mom's heritage. My father um, is uh, from uh, Bermuda and I was born here about 41 years ago. Um, but I guess I would say my uh, upbringing um, is one where I was fortunate, and I say fortunate in regards to that uh, both my parents are entrepreneurs, and so I never actually saw my parents work for anyone. And so I learned the value of hard work at a very young age. Um, and I remember uh, working with them 
uh, it was, you know, Thursdays doing payroll and different things and just understanding, uh, you know, what it was like in order to run a business and seeing the sacrifices of which they certainly made for me at a young age. That's amazing. And I mean, you took on that entrepreneurship as well, because as looking at your bio and understood that you co-founded a major app. Well, uh, IT was always uh, my first love. It was my first love before politics. Uh, I remember how much I loved IT um, as a child and I actually got into a very strange story is I'm a pilot. So I'm actually a, uh, I learned, I got my pilot's license at the age of 17. I went to military, I went to military boarding school in Florida um, at this place called Florida Air Academy. The few people from Jamaica went to school there as well, in addition to Bermuda. So I went to uh, Florida Air Academy and I went because I wanted to learn how to fly. My parents wanted to get me out of Bermuda, I wasn't doing uh, well here as a uh, young uh, man, and they sent me away to uh, military boarding school, not for discipline purposes, but more just to get me out of the environment. And so I actually excelled there, but I did get my pilot's license. But I, in there, because I was always into flying, I actually got into computers. And so we do playing old flight simulator games, and that was really the reason how I got into computers. The funny story is back then, in the early 90s, uh, computers weren't like they were now, you press the button and they just pop on, you know, you had to do things to get programs to start and all the rest. And literally, in order to run the flight simulators, I would have to go to the, the mall, to the electronics boutique and buy the little book or look it up and find out what to do and write it down in order to program. So that's how I got into uh, computers. So it, was, it became my first love. Um, I um, ended up actually going to university and getting a dual major in finance and information systems. But the first computer program I wrote was actually a program to do my father's payroll for his construction company at the age of 13. Wow! So, yeah, so that was, at the so age that, of 13. Yeah, uh, yes, it was, it, yeah. So that was that was my background when it came to computers. So I, I love computers and it was actually how I got involved in politics. I came back to the country. Um, I was doing something I, I had interviewed who happened to be my next door neighbor. Uh, for a job, and my next door neighbor was actually the deputy chairman of the Progressive Labor Party. We got into a conversation, and he said, "Oh, when well, you have a lot of ideas, you should join the party. And you can ask the, you know, the party leader these questions." And I was like, "So I can come and sign up and ask the leader of the country?" And he says, "Yes." And I signed up the next week, and I went inside. But I got involved in the party uh, by doing technology. So I was the technology person and set up email systems and set up websites and set up all different types of things. So that was actually my ticket into politics. Into politics. Yes. And before we even go further into your political story as well, because back to bits of the technology, I understand as well that there was an app. Well, I think it's a taxi service Call that you helped to co-found called Exactly Hitch. Tell me about that and how did that come about? Uh, Hitch came about uh, <laughs> uh, as I went to school in, in America and going to school in America, I remember the first time I used Uber was a godsend because black men getting taxis in America um, back then and I remember the first time I used Uber was I want to say maybe like 2011. Um, back when they didn't even have the app, I had a Blackberry and you could text still and you could get an Uber uh, to come to you. But I remember what it was like uh, being a black man, getting a cab in Washington, D.C. when I went to school there. And I remember I had a similar experience one year where my wife and I, uh, we were in the west end of the island. It was a tourism, it was, it was our anniversary and it was really, really busy and we couldn't get a taxi and I was just frustrated. And I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine that, a week later and he had said the same thing. And I was like, you know what, I'm, we're going to build an app. And so we just went to building an app. And this time, I wasn't in full-time politics. I was, in I was in opposition. And I just, you know, I just came up with this idea. So it was fun. It was probably the most rewarding IT project that I've ever worked on uh, to set up something that worked like that. And it's, the fact is that it is just completely automated. So I remember the first night that it launched, it was around December 2015. And we were just literally watching on the screen how this thing was just going and going and people were booking rides and the people were answering rides and there was nothing for us to do. We didn't have to call, we didn't have to do anything, it just worked and it was just an amazing experience. Yeah, that's going on five years now, we're celebrating its fifth anniversary in December. Okay, so you're a big businessman. So on to the politics, you mentioned a bit in terms of how you started out doing a lot of the technological you know, happenings in the party. But how did you move from the IT experts to becoming the premier? 
<laughs> uh, it was. I, I, I don't want to necessarily say it was a natural transition, uh, but it, uh, at the time that I became, I actually uh, was elected the youngest chairman of the Progressive Labor Party in t- in 2006, and I served, and I just wanted to uh, bring a little bit of youth into the party, and I also wanted to, um, I guess, you know, make sure that the technology was more represented in part of what the party did. So I was elected chairman in 2006. It was a volunteer position, not a full-time position. And so I was balancing uh, my uh, work with that and uh, uh, helped run the 2007 election campaign. And then in 2009, I left politics. I resigned as chairman of the party uh, as a 31-year-old and I had had enough. And I said, yeah, you know, I've had my experience. It was lovely, it was fun. Now it's time for me to go off and do business and enjoy my life and not have to worry about the press and the media anywhere else. And a year later, the deputy uh, premier at the time, the deputy leader of the party, was running for leadership and she asked me to join her team. And funny enough, it took me, um, most people in politics would answer right away and say, absolutely sure, I I will. And it actually took me a full month to decide. I had to to talk to my friends, I ended up talking to my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. Um, who gave me the advice that says, um, you know, opportunities don't come along very often. Uh, you can always leave if you don't like it, but you probably will never have the op- other opportunity to do it if it comes around. And so she convinced me, that's why I always joke with her, you can't get mad at me, you were the one who got me back into this. <laughs> and so I joined uh, the party, uh, not, I joined her team. Uh, she won the leadership of the party. I was appointed to the Senate and served her chief of staff. I won a seat in the House of Assembly in 2012. And in 2016, after the leader of the party uh, resigned, I ended up becoming the leader of the party in an internal party election. And then we came to power in a uh, landslide election picture in 2017. And at the time you were. Exactly. And at the time you were 38 years old. I was. Wow. I am, you know, looking on and thinking, was it, you know, challenging for you being so young? and be the leader of a nation? Uh, yes, uh, the biggest challenge uh, for me is not, I mean, I've always been someone to challenge, um, I would say, age stereotypes. And it was one of the reasons that um, I ended up running for chairman of the party. Because I remember when I got involved and they were like, oh, you know, you go play in the youth wing kind of thing. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm old enough to participate. Don't send me over there in the sandbox, you know, inside of it. So from, from that perspective, um, I say no. I say the diff- most difficult thing about being so young um, in this position is uh, the balancing of the young family. That's the most challenging part about it. And sometimes I actually feel that you know both jobs get cheated because of the demands of both jobs. Um, but I look at it in so far as it's no different than any other family uh, that has to balance you know work and uh, family uh, life. So yeah, I I can feel guilty about it, but it's no different than any other family uh, and the struggles in which they go through to balance those things. And as a leader, Premier Byrd, but also a, a businessman, and as you mentioned, a family man, you know, throughout your career to date, you know, what has been your greatest challenge? Ah, my greatest challenge is actually, um, <laughs> it, it, when, when, when I look back at it, it, my greatest challenge is, you know, stopping to pause and just to take stock, and just to relax. I. Um, I'm naturally wired to just keep going and going and going. And so the greatest challenge is certainly just, you know, to take a step back and, you know, relax. Um, politics sometimes, you know, sets people up, up, upon each other um, in a not uh, so positive light. And so those are things which are always um, challenging. But I would say that from the uh, the fortunate career that I've been able to have at a young age, the biggest challenge that I have is, you know, taking that time to stop reflecting, you know, give thanks. Or what inspires you? <laughs> <laughs> or where do you children? or where do you get inspiration from <laughs> uh, my, my, my children inspire me no question about it and I mean when you're in politics uh, you look at those people who are close to you um, but you also have to um, look at you know the reason I guess why I do this job and so when you get to walk around especially now you may not know that we're in the middle of an election campaign <laughs> election day is exactly two weeks away um, October 1st. Uh, but, you know, when you get to knock on doors, when you get to talk to people, they thank you. Um, they say, I remember the most poignant moment um, in my time in office, and it was very early inside of my career, uh, that we decided to take the cabinet meeting to the Bermuda College. And one of the things which we first did when we came into office is we said that 
there will be no one inside of Bermuda who cannot go to the Bermuda College and get um, a associate's degree or um, a um, or get a certification because they cannot afford to do so. And I remember there was this woman who came, the cabinet went up there, and it was um, culinary uh, arts class, and she literally came to the table and she said, "Thank you, because if it wasn't for you, I would not have been able to be here. And this is always my dream." And so it's that type of stuff that inspires you to keep on going because you can actually have a real impact in people's lives and you can feel it, and then they let you know. Yes, and I mean, you mentioned election coming up. This is not a political program, but as a young leader, nonetheless, what would you think of, you know, to date as the, the highlight of your career? Uh, the highlight of my career in politics is certainly, I mean, certainly um, having this job uh, is there and uh, winning another general election uh, would certainly uh, rank among that. Uh, but what I would say is that I think I, I measure but we do more of the accomplishments, the change in which I'm able to make inside of my country. My country is just a very conservative country by nature. Um, and so, you know, I say that I'm just dragging and screaming, you know, dragging my country into the 21st century, kicking and screaming. And I just measure uh, what we are able to do as a country or my success by how I can manage to transform this country and make it ready for the future. Definitely. We are big on purpose here as Trailblazers. We have young, old and in between watching. So, I mean, I don't know if you believe you your job is part of your purpose in life or, you know, as you mentioned, you kind of fell into it. So what, what is it for you or which is it for you? Um, I'm a firm believer um, in uh, that life is ordained uh, by the Creator, and so from my belief, it certainly is my purpose. It's not something that um, I can't say that I've always been far away from politics. I was the leader of my university. I was like the president of my university, so it's not like I ever shied away from uh, leadership positions. Uh, but I can say that you know the the, the events. Uh, that transpired to get me to this position, I think are uh, part of my purpose. And I think that that is why I put so much energy into trying to do my job on any given uh, day, because I think that it is the reason why I'm here and to advance, um, I would say, advance the people that I serve. Definitely. And I'm wrapping up, you know, time is winding down, but for somebody who's big on technology and you know right now we are in a digital revolution globally especially because of the pandemic everything you know is online what are some of the ways do you think as leaders and collectively as a people we can tap into that for our own benefit um technology is something that is going to be not only the future but will just be the way of life and so I think that what's incumbent upon leaders, incumbent upon all persons, is to make sure uh, that people are digitally aware, that you do, that you reduce that digital divide. One of the things which we've done here in Bermuda is that I, when I came into office, not even all of our schools had Wi-Fi. It was one of the first things that we did to make sure that we don't have that digital divide. If you can imagine the countries which rich as Bermuda with primary schools that didn't have Wi-Fi, it's kind of, you know, it's like shocking. But we, but it's about making sure we do that. We put, added more technology classes through all levels of our uh, curriculum. Uh, we've added more technology classes in uh, at, at our university, I'm um, sorry, at our college, and also we're trying to make sure that we use financial technology to bring financial freedom to so many people inside of our island. So uh, technology is certainly going to be future. Uh, you've seen the way the internet has changed the way in which we interact and communicate. Uh, financial technology will change the way in which we store value, in which we transfer value, and it's going to revolutionize the world. And so from the perspective which I have, I would say that I think that it's important as persons, and I would say especially persons from island nations, that we actually prepare ourselves for this, make sure that we are in the leadership position for this, harness this energy and not allow it to be created or dominated by uh, the forces, I would say, of colonialism who dominated our economic system before. Definitely. Premier, I understand that there's a specific book that revolutionized your life. Tell me about that book. <laughs> Uh, it was, I want to say in 2007 or 2008, I was going through an airport and I saw this book. It said the four hour work week. And I got it and I had a read of it. And it, you know, had actually, you know, broadened the horizons of the new digital economy, how you could distribute work, how you can, you know, almost um, section off your life, how you can hire virtual assistants on the internet to help with certain portions so you can focus on the things of which you actually could only do yourself, whereas there are other things that people could do for you. And it's a book that I uh, certainly uh, made uh, not only my IT life and business life better, but also my personal life better as well.
or Premier Bird. So my final question for you as other young people are looking on and they see you quite accomplished, still young and the leader of a nation. What are some of the top tips that you would give to us, you know, for us to become a success because we want to be like you one day. Like if somebody wants to be a leader of a nation or a leader in their industry or in their field, what are some key tips, some key disciplines that we need to embody? I would say that um, you just have to work at it and be committed uh, to what you want to do. Uh, the persons who manage to win, uh, whether they be in sports, uh, whether they be in business or whether they be in politics, are the person who will stay later than others, who will come earlier than others, who will do that little extra bit of work and who will not say no and do not find themselves uh, too big for any position. I think one of the hallmarks and one of the reasons why I think that I was elected as leader of my party is because people saw the work of which I did and knew that at any level of the party that I was not afraid to get my hands dirty. I was not afraid to do the menial jobs. No job <clears throat> was too small uh, just to make sure that you work to get uh, the team across the line. So I think that's the best bit of advice in which I can give. Don't, don't be too proud to do anything. Um, and you have to respect persons at all levels. Um, so the organization doesn't work if the person at the very bottom isn't doing what they're doing uh, just as much as it doesn't work if the person at the very top does. Everyone um, has, is an integral part of the team and you just have to make sure uh, that you remember that as a leader and play whatever part needs to be played at that time. Definitely. And I appreciate the tips that you shared. I know you have Jamaican parentage, as you mentioned. I hope you've learned how to cook ackee and saltfish and the works. <laughs> my, my culinary skills are not the best, but my uh, favorite, but, but, but my favorite, well, I have, I have a few favorite uh, Jamaican uh, things that I like to eat. My, my favorite is uh, roast breadfruits, without question. And you get me roast breadfruits and uh, kalaloo and ackee, I'm good. Uh, without question, Kalu and saltfish. So if that's the thing that it is, but I'm I'm very strange because I don't do spicy food, and you know I'm not too much into when, when it gets a little bit more exotic with the manishwata and all that is the minute in it. So <laughs> don't go that far. All right, thank you so much, Premier Bird. It was an honor to have this experience with you. I've never been to Bermuda, so one of these days I will definitely come and visit, and um, we can do this again in person. So thank Absolutely. you so much. I appreciate it and all the best and continue to be a trailblazer. Well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to sit down with you and continue to be doing the excellent work for which you continue to do, Ms. McGill. Thank you. Right, take care.